Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Consulting Surveyors New South Wales monthly webinar that we hold on the second Friday of every month at this time. Today, we are partnering with Consulting Surveyors National to bring you an update on the Professional Standards Scheme. And I've got here, which won't work with my Zoom background, but um, if you can sort of see this, this is the official certificate to say that we actually do have the, uh, oh, this way here, see? Oh. There we go. So it's actually official. Uh, we're certified and we are running the scheme to June 2025. So we're very excited about that. It's been quite a long path for us to uh, get the scheme up and happening. Uh, special thanks to Paul Mather who put in a huge amount of work towards the scheme and the Consulting Surveyors National Board uh, who have also done that. So we wanna say welcome to everybody. We know that we've got people joining us from around the country today uh, and there will be some who will be watching this video afterwards. And so we hope that you enjoy today's presentation. We've invited Steve Bishop, who is running the administration for the scheme and the training and really all things scheme oriented. He knows it all. Just tell, you can tell by the books in his background there, he's very well read and he's completely up to speed. So what we're going to do today is give you an overview of what the scheme is about, what it looks like, how you can be involved and what's required of you uh, under the professional standard scheme. So just a few housekeeping tips before we get started. Uh, this is a webinar, not a Zoom meeting, so it's a little bit different. Uh, if you want to chat down the bottom, you need to choose to chat. If you want to chat to everybody, you need to choose uh, all panellists and attendees, or you can just chat to myself and Steve through the all panellists component. Uh, I don't think you can chat to individuals during this type of setup. Uh, but if you have a particular question, could we ask that you use the Q&A box and I'll make sure that your questions are relayed to Steve directly or we'll answer them together for you uh, during this session. So uh, Steve's got a little bit of interaction for you today, so that should be good. And if you are watching this webinar after the recording, so anybody who's live gets their one point, but anybody who's watching it after the recording will need to answer the six questions with 80% accuracy in order to get their CPD point. So uh, I'll be taking the questions. I'll try not to make them too hard. I had feedback that apparently the questions are too hard, but no, they're not. It'll be fine. So, uh, Steve, everybody, do you all know Steve? Steve's based up in Newcastle and he's actually a registered surveyor. So ask him anything really, uh, but particularly about the scheme. Over to you, Steve. Uh, thanks for the intro, Michelle. I'll just uh, attempt to share my screen now. Beautiful. That's working okay, I assume. Um, so as Michelle pointed out, um, the Professional Standards Scheme uh, became live on uh, July the 1st this year um, and runs for five years with uh, the option to renew for another five years after that. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today um, is on that agenda list there. We're gonna go through some key partnerships behind the scheme, a bit of background uh, how the scheme came about and, and then go into some sort of detailed explanation of how the scheme works and um, who, who can participate and, and then towards the end we'll go through um, a practical example. Some of the feedback I've had so far is that um, entry into the scheme via some of the forms that are available was, was a little bit complicated and there's a few grey areas um, surrounding that. So. Um, I trust everyone can hear me okay. Um, so, uh, as with everything that, that um, we do, uh, there's a disclaimer for you so that it, it, everything to sort of discuss here is of a general nature only. And um, if you want some more specific advice, you should seek um, your own advice on specific matters. So, I'll make note of that. On, there are a couple of slides there where um, you should seek your specific, own specific advice, um, when, when, particularly when dealing with some of the legislation surrounding the scheme. Um, so 
before we start, what I might get you to everyone to do is um, you can see a little link there in blue at the bottom of that page. Um, and that's an online questionnaire that I prepared. Um, and I just want to get a bit of feedback from everyone as to um, what they've heard about the scheme so far. It's also a bit of a roll call um, so that we, we sort of make sure everyone hasn't just logged in and, and gone to make themselves a cup of coffee and go and have some lunch. Um, just to make sure everyone's in there and participating. So if you can all maybe open up another window and, uh, and go to that, follow that link and answer that question. And in the meantime, I might try and, um, and go to the results page for that. Can everyone see that? I had to actually, actually, I had to, um, I might try and post it in the chat, everybody, just the link, because uh, you had to type it, hang on. Some people have accessed it already. That's the link there, everybody. Michelle, can you still see my screen as being a big pie chart with some um, colours on it? Uh, no, you're not running the um, the slideshow. How that's, about now? Now I can see the pie chart. Yep. Okay, so that's a um, a live uh, feed from that survey, and as you can see, most people have heard about the scheme, um, but haven't given it much thought. There are a number that have already registered, uh, and then the other major contributor is, is I've uh, never heard about the scheme at all. So this will be particularly um, useful to those people that, that haven't actually heard about the scheme, um, this, this presentation. Uh, those that haven't given it much thought, hopefully this will be enough to convince you to uh, you know, join the scheme and, and start participating. All right, so I'll just close that down and I'll go back to the slideshow. Okay, so as I mentioned, there, there's a number of key partnerships in, in this uh, scheme. Um, obviously, can't right see, at the centre. Can't see your slides. Can't Sorry. see them? No. You can still, you can still take part in the, um, in the webinar questions. Steve will get that, those answers afterwards. So keep going. All good, everybody. What about now, Michelle? Is that, has that come nope. up now? No. Nope. Certainly here at my end. What about now? No. Nope. Yeah, okay. Okay, better? Yep, yep, that's it, yep, okay. great. So, as I said, the key partnerships are at the centre of this is the Professional Standards Scheme, which is um, in part uh, monitored by the Professional Standards Council. Um, at the top of the scheme there, you've got Consulting Surveyors National, who are effectively the host of the scheme. Um, and dropping down to the sides, you've got two entities there, Consulting Surveyors Admin and Consulting Surveyors Campus. So those entities have been created to perform the, the regulatory functions of um, education and, and reporting. So um, at the end of each scheme period, there's, a, there's some reporting to be done on the, on the numbers in the, the scheme, the number of individuals and firms. Um, and, and the res any results from the, 
uh, that have come about from the training. So essentially the monitoring that will be done will be, you know, have there been less professional indemnity claims as a result of the scheme? Um, has the training been effective? So they're looking for results from, from this scheme. It's, it's not just a token scheme. They, they need to see some, some results um, from the participation in the scheme. Now, at the bottom of that bubble, um, you've got AXIS, uh, uh, Australian Consulting Surveyors Insurance Society. Um, they, are, they actually provide the resources um, for those two smaller entities to, to run. So, um, provide staff and, and the, the training facilities and that type of thing. All right, so just um, Consulting Surveyors National, for those who, who don't know, um, a national body. Um, anyone who's a member, current member of Consulting Surveyors Victoria or Consulting Surveyors New South Wales, gain automatic membership into uh, CSN. Um, soon we'll have Consulting Surveyors South Australia on board and, and no doubt automatic membership will be granted to those people as well. Um, but this Consulting Surveyors National membership is, is open to a, a surveyors right across the country, um, and particularly in those states that don't have um, state representation. All right, now the other um, entity that was on that, that bubble uh, is AXIS, who I'm directly employed by. Um, and they essentially facilitate PI insurance, risk, risk management services, um, and PI claim support. And essentially they under, underpin uh, this professional standard scheme. Um, now their involvement, as Michelle alluded to earlier, um, it's taken the best part of four years to put this scheme together. And, and uh, Paul May has been at the very heart of this in constant consultation with lawyers, um, professional standards council, um, and, and other professionals, um, including those who were part of the previous um, professional standards scheme. Um, the other notable mentions there are Peter Friedman, Ian Marler, and Jerry Schoen, for those uh, Victorians who are, who are online, uh, they'll know Jerry. They all had some, some significant input into putting this scheme together as well. There was a lot of um, uh, iterations, I suppose you'd say, um, of the documentation that was provided um, to, to put this scheme together and a lot of uh, compromise and, and consultation. So, um, as I mentioned, Access will provide the, the, the resources and, and the staff to, that will run the scheme essentially. Um, Probably the, 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 one of the most important parts of, of Access's involvement is, is that um, our link to the claims data um, that we have on board, currently we have about 40% of the market um, in terms of professional indemnity for the surveying industry. So that gives us access to a lot of um, claims data that we can use to tailor the training that's associated with the scheme to those um, areas that we really need to target where the, the current problems lie and the current trends are. Um, just a little note down the bottom there, in, in a vast majority of cases, um, that major catastrophes could have been avoided by simple steps, um, such as independent checks, um, getting things in writing and defining your limit of involvement. And there's some of the things that we'll be sort of touching on um, during the training, uh, the risk management training that's associated with this scheme. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today about the scheme is I'm going to go into what, what exactly is a professional standard scheme, um, what the purpose of any scheme is, um, who, who can be covered by this particular professional standard scheme, um, how does it work, of course, and the legislation that underpins the scheme. All right, so I'm just going to play a little video now. Uh, hopefully it works. Michelle, just um, interrupt if it doesn't work, or particularly with the sound. Will do.
professional standard schemes are a way of capturing the obligations, the commitments that professions make to the professional standards councils on behalf of Australian consumers to do the right thing. Technically, they're an element of law where the organisation commits to certain obligations and practices that they'll enforce upon their members that deliver consumer protection. But perhaps more than that, they describe and they demonstrate a commitment by the association to better consumer protection. Okay, so that's a, that's a rather gen generic uh, interpretation of professional standard scheme, because bear in mind, these professional standard schemes cover, cover other professions like um, accountants and lawyers and, and the like. So, but, but the key take home messages were, were that, that technically they're an element of law uh, and they're designed to capture the obligations of, of the profession. So this, this slide I've got in front of me now, the, the purpose of the scheme essentially is to protect um, customers and, and consumers. Uh, it does that by um, promoting and improving uh, standards and, and it also helps associations like CSN um, because it gives the, the members of those associations uh, another benefit to being a member of those associations. So it makes them more attractive, uh, essentially. And throughout the presentation, we'll, we'll go about how it addresses each of those um, items there. All right, so um, how does it work? Um, the, the trigger, I guess, is to what the scheme does is, is offers um, a participant a, a, a limitation on, on liability. So we'll go through what those limitations are and what those caps are, but essentially what it's saying is, is that where, if you, you know, in, in company, um, encounter a PI claim against you, um, we can cap your liability um, to a certain amount depending on your, um, your annual turnover. So, but the, the catch is in return for that liability cap, um, you've got, A, you've got to carry the appropriate level of PI insurance. Uh, the second thing you've got to do is disclose to all your clients that you're participating in the scheme um, and that your liability is capped. Now, essentially, what you're doing there is essentially you're taking away the, the rights of a consumer to be able to sue you beyond um, what your liability cap might be. So an example might be if you happen to make a mistake on a, on a project that's quite a large project and, and the, the damage is awarded by, by the court might be in the, three million, in the order of $3 million and you've got a, a liability cap of $2 million, well, the most that you and, and your insurer will need to pay out would be the $2 million. And, that the additional million dollars is, for, is foregone. Um, so, so that's essentially taking some, so some of the rights away from the consumer. Um, but hopefully by being part of this scheme and, and, and doing the, the training uh, that's associated with it, um, you're improving standards. So the likelihood of those things happening uh, are reduced. And, and as I mentioned, the third thing there is that um, you've got to do some compulsory risk management training a, as part of the scheme. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the resulting higher standards benefit the consumer as, essentially by reducing you know, the risk of things going wrong. Um, and then participants in the scheme will essentially be held in a higher regard by being part of an, a, a professional standard scheme because their, their standards will be essentially higher than those not participating. All right, so the, the liability caps. So these, are, these liability caps have been set in line with um, insurance standards. So if you look at that first one there, class one, uh, that would apply to a vast majority of surveying um, firms where their uh, annual turnover is less than two million. So therefore you're granted a monetary ceiling of $2 million. So any claim made against you um, over $2 million will be capped at, at $2 million. Um, 
and then as you read down the list, any, any firm turning over between two and five, uh, their, their liability is capped at five million. Anyone earn, uh, turning over greater than five, their liability is capped at 10 million. Um, now, that last one there, uh, discretionary higher cap is, is for those firms that um, perhaps do work that uh, for a government department or, uh, or something like that, that don't particularly want a small liability cap. So say for instance, someone in ordinarily in class one with a cap of $2 million might be working for a government authority that requires you to have uh, a $10 million cap. That affords you the luxury of varying that cap in certain circumstances. So it, the, the work you do for 90% of the time, you can have that cap at $2 million, but for those clients that, that want a specific monetary value, you can have that discretionary higher cap. Um, next is who can be covered by the scheme? So essentially, um, the, the definition, the CSN definition of, of what a surveyor does has been derived from the FIG definition. They're very, very similar. Um, and there's, there's about 10 different activities that covers what a surveyor does. I've highlighted three there that um, I think are just a little bit out of the ordinary, particularly for those firms that lie outside of New South Wales. Uh, New South Wales tends to have quite a few multidisciplinary firms, whereas outside at, um, that jurisdiction, um, they're a little bit fewer and far between. So but those extra activities really apply to people like town planners, um, certifiers, um, engineers who are working on um, you know, subdivisions and things like that. So those extra definitions um, cover those people. Um, and th those, that definition of, of what a surveyor does is also covered in the legislation. So it, it, you can see what those other you know, six or seven points are, but they're, they're typically um, those traditional measurement type activities that a surveyor would, would do. Um, now, how is it different to other previous schemes? There are quite a few people online that were probably part of the, uh, the old Professional Surveyors uh, Occupational Association, um, which, is, which is very similar, capped liability. Um, the, the key difference was that, uh, that there wasn't any specific risk management training. Um, the, the continuing occupational education or CPD or, or FPET or whatever you want to call it, um, the only requirement there was to uh, com complete, I think it was 15 hours, um, but that could have been in, in any particular activities. Uh, it wasn't specific to risk management. And I'll go in a little bit further along, we'll go into some specifics about how much risk management you need to complete. As, as opposed to other, other activities. Um, the other thing that, that differs from the, the old scheme is, is that now there's um, a sp specific um, service on, on board to uh, monitor and regulate and, and, and re report back to the Professional Standards Council. Previously, uh, this was done by essentially some volunteers. Um, uh, Michelle got on board to um, formalise those reporting routines back to the Professional Standards Council. Um, but now we have a, a dedicated team that, that performs those functions. Um, and as I mentioned, the, the training involved with this scheme as opposed to the previous schemes is that it's, it's required to have a risk management focus. Um, now the legislation that, that underpins the scheme uh, can be found at that link. Uh, as I mentioned, commenced on uh, July the 1st, um, and that link will take you to the various gazettals in, in each of the states so, and, and territories. Um, it's not yet up online uh, on any of the legislation 
specific websites and it's still not online on the Professional Standards Council's website, but I'm sure it will be uh, shortly. But, but rest assured, um, the scheme is live and, uh, and the legislation is, is active. Um, so as I mentioned, there were certain things you need to fulfil to um, comply with the scheme. And, and the first is, um, you know, possessing some PI insurance that, that matches the, the cap that you're afforded. So believe it or not, there are practitioners out there without PI insurance. Um, it, it's got to be noted that, that PI isn't compulsory in most states. Um, there are states where it is. Um, but it, but in the you know, the majority it, it's not, um, and as I said, the, the the key element of this scheme is to ensure that everyone who participates has PI insurance, and and therein lies that protection for the consumer that that um, the Professional Standards Council were talking about. So, um, sure they're capping the liability of a surveyor, but they're ensuring that that surveyor does have the PI to back that up if something does go wrong. So, um, yeah, as I mentioned, there are some practitioners out there without PI, and that presents a great risk to any consumer that, that uses their services. Um, because if something goes wrong, um, they're relying on that uh, practitioner's assets to to cover the bill and if there's uh, if there's no assets well then there's there's no cover um, so in this case the consumers um, who's dealing with a participant in the scheme is guaranteed that that participant carries the appropriate level of, of pi um, and don't forget those levels of pi uh, are based on your annual turnover and as i mentioned that they're they're, um, they're based on insurance standards so that someone who's turning over more than $5 million a year has that higher cap because they're more likely to be participating in those projects that are more risky, that are, are more expensive if something goes wrong. Um, whereas someone who's perhaps a sole practitioner um, is, is unlikely to be doing um, any sort of significant um, you know, maybe state-based projects that, that would attract those higher um, claims if they do happen. Um, as I mentioned, there's room um, for variability um, by having a discretionary higher cap if you're doing work for government departments or public authorities that, that request those higher caps. Um, there'll be a question and answer at the end, so, um, uh, I'm sure there'll be some questions on this, so um, save them till the end. Um, the other thing each participant has to do, as I mentioned, they've got to disclose to all their clients that they're participating in the scheme. Uh, it sort of almost serves as a warning to the clients that, um, that they do have a liability cap, but it also serves as, as a, you know, advertisement that yes we're participating in this scheme which means we're doing this risk management training which means our standards are typically higher than someone who's not participating um, so I'll go through another slide a little bit later which talks a little bit more about that but those disclosure requirements uh, are set in concrete and as you mentioned you can go to the website there and, and find out exactly what those disclosure requirements are. Essentially, at the bottom of all your letterheads, emails, you know, plans, all your correspondence, um, you've got to have those words in bold to, to advise everyone that you're participating in this scheme. Um, you can put the logo on as well, but that's only optional. Um, so the third thing you've got to do is participate in the continuing occupational education, um, which essentially translates to the risk management training. Uh, it's been called COE so that it captures um, all the different states and jurisdictions. Everyone calls it something different in each state. Um, in Queensland, there's no requirement for compulsory 
um, CPD or FPET to maintain your uh, registration. They have a different system up there. Most other states have some sort of compulsory um, education or continuing education. So this is this has been named such so that it, it captures everyone and doesn't alienate any particular jurisdiction. Um, as I mentioned there, the holistic reason why you, you want to participate is that you believe in the education and training of your staff. Um, you believe it'll you know, relate to or, or translate to improved standards and, and less mistakes. Um, on the other side of the equation, the, the legislative reason is that it that it's you know, been made compulsory by this scheme um, that you have to participate. Um, now, why do all staff has to have to participate? So, as part of the um, the, the, the COE policy from CSN, that it, it specifies that all staff have to participate. Now, you might ask why. Um, if you talk to most surveyors or, or um, practitioners or, or business owners, they'll say that they never make mistakes. It's always their staff. It's always the drafts person or the admin person that makes the mistakes and they never make the mistakes. But the, the real reason is essentially that, that everyone on that wheel is part of the um, equation. So everyone plays a part in putting these projects together. Um, so at, at every step of the way, there, there's a risk of, of something going wrong. So everyone needs to participate so that they can learn some good risk management techniques. They can see the um, now how their actions um, at whatever level they're participating, um, they can affect the final outcome of, of any project. Now. Yeah. The, the COE requirements. Um, so it's broken down into to four categories. Um, category one requiring five hours down to category four requiring two. Now you can see under those categories the different levels of, of people involved in any organisation and, and how many hours and modules that they need to, to complete and, and participate in. Um, now that's that's just basically because you know some people at uh, the category four level who might be a field assistant or, or a part-time receptionist, uh, they may not need to know everything that the, the people at that category one level uh, needs to know. There's some things that they just don't even see within the office. Um, now bear in mind these are minimum requirements. So, um, you know, if someone's in category three and, and feels like they need to um, participate in, in activities that are in category four, then, then by all means, they can certainly uh, participate in, in that category two. And later on, I'll show you a bit of a list of, of some of the um, uh, risk management training um, topics that will be covered. Um, also down the bottom there, I've got a little note about um, individual members of CSN. So that's something I didn't touch on before. Um, there's two, essentially two types of, of membership of the scheme. There, there's um, corporate membership, which is obviously the, the, the firm. And, and that's quite critical because it's the, the firm who usually carries the, the PI insurance policy and, and they need to be uh, covered by the scheme. Uh, but there's also individual membership, which covers those people. And, and what I've been telling uh, participants is that individual members need to nominate themselves if they've got some sort of responsibility or a statutory authority to sign documentation. So, so typically individual members would be um, directors or partners of, of um, firms or any licensed or registered surveyors or engineers or town planners that, that sign under some sort of statutory authority. Now, the, the, the catch is that um, other people can be individual members. As I said, these are all minimum requirements. 
but if you nominate yourself as an individual member, not only do you have to get five hours of this risk management training, but you also have to get a further 10 hours of COE to make up 15, which is, which is in the COE policy. Now, you can go online and, and look up the COE policy, um, but essentially someone who's not um, a licensed or registered surveyor who would ordinarily have to get 15 points to maintain their license or registration anyway, uh, it, it may be quite difficult for someone um, who, who isn't one of those people to, to get it and find an extra 10 hours. Now, you can, you can get those hours by doing a number of different activities as outlined in the policy. Um, but you know, as people have just discovered through, um, through COVID and, and the lack of, um, I guess, face-to-face -face seminars that have been happening from, you know, since February, essentially, trying to get COE or CPD points, whatever you want to call it, has been a little difficult. Um, so, so moving forward, if you want to nominate yourself as an individual member, um, of CSN uh, and therefore uh, an individual participant in the scheme, uh, you just need to think about how you might get that extra extra 10 hours. Um, so I was asked to provide uh, a practical example because um, some people were, there, were, there was a few grey areas when filling out the forms and, and understanding um, who fits in what category. So I've just prepared a small example of a typical firm with seven staff and a turnover of $1.2 million annually. And going down that list of, of people there, that's their list of, of staff and their qualification. Um, so I'll, I'll just go through the example of uh, filling in the form and how they might fit into the scheme. Um, so this is the uh, application form for the scheme. And, and the first question, apart from your, your personal details, is what liability cap are you uh, adopting? Uh, now, essentially that's, that's sort of uh, you know, given for you. That, that's just solely based on your uh, last year's financial um, turnover. So that's sort of set in concrete. And unless you apply for that discretionary higher cap, which is in that category below. Um, but keep in mind is that ordinarily your cap is based on your previous financial year's turnover. Uh, now the next page of the form relates to just how many staff you've got that governs what the administration fee is for the scheme. Now, the, the makeup of that in, uh, administration fee, part of that goes back to CSN for um, administration purposes. Uh, the other part goes to the Professional Standards Council. So each individual member and each corporate member attracts a fee from the Professional Standards Council. And then the remainder goes to consulting surveyors, admin, to administer and report on, on the scheme at the end of each uh, quarter and at the end of each financial year. Uh, the next part is quite important. Um, that left-hand side contains a declaration. Um, so by signing that form, um, and it particularly relates to the uh, liability cap, um, you, you've nominated the, the liability cap that best fits your annual turnover category, and you're signing that declaration saying that you've done that in good faith. So uh, there, there may be a tendency for um, people that sit in one category to undervalue themselves to, so that they attract a lower liability cap. Um, there's, there's no policing of that from um, uh, Professional Standards Council end. Um, but by signing that declaration, you're saying that you've been honest in, in providing that information. Um, if, if you did happen to sign that and, and weren't particularly honest, it may come back to bite you if you ever had to rely on that 
that uh, liability cap. Um, so that declaration is, is quite important. Um, the next thing is a, is a checklist that you need to provide uh, when handing back the, the form. So the, the three key elements I've just highlighted there, you need to um, provide evidence that you are carrying the appropriate amount of, of PI cover uh, to match your liability cap. Um, you need to provide evidence that you uh, disclose to your clients that you're participating in, in the scheme. Um, and that's by way of putting, you know, submitting a letterhead, a sample letterhead with that wording um, on the bottom. And the third thing is that you need to ensure that you're a member of uh, CSN. Now, as I mentioned previously, if, if you're already a member of Consulting Surveyors Victoria or New South Wales, you, you gain automatic membership. Um, if you're from those other jurisdictions, you need to um, talk to Michelle to, to make sure that you're covered um, by the appropriate CSN membership as well. Essentially, CSN membership is enter, uh, a, a stepping stone for entry into, into the scheme. Um, it, it, CSN is hosting the scheme and, and the scheme is virtually a, a byproduct or, or, or a benefit of being a CSN member. Now, uh, the final page of, of that uh, administration form lists the individual members. So just, just bear in mind what, what I spoke about before, about the obligations of those individual members. Not only do they need to do five hours of um, risk management training, they've got to do a further 10 hours of uh, some sort of training, COE, um, that, that is non-risk management related. So that can be quite a commitment. Um, if someone's a, you know, a registered or licensed surveyor, that, as I said, it might be quite easy. They may have to get those points um, ordinarily anyway, so it doesn't become an issue. But if you look in this example here, um, one of the partners of this firm who sh should be an individual member as carrying responsibility and being a director of a, of a firm, um, that person's a survey technician and, and ordinarily, you know, to, you know, to keep up their, um, their qualification, they wouldn't need to, um, you know, acquire any of those CPD or COE points. Now that may change in the future, but, but currently um, that, that's not a requirement only for, for licensed people. And look, the same would go for those people in, in Queensland who don't have to um, uh, acquire any uh, COE points as part of their licensing, to my knowledge anyway. Um, right, so the second part is, so that's the, the administration um, side of things. This second part of, of the forms that, that need to be filled in relates to the risk management training, um, the, the continuing occupational education. Now, um, you would have seen that table before, this table's been superimposed onto the form um, and, and highlights um, what role you play in the organisation and what, uh, what, what number of hours you need to participate in to fulfil your requirements. Uh, so skipping forward to the next page, listing all those um, employees there again. Um, one I wanted to point out, if you look at George there, George is listed as a field assistant, but I should have pointed out previously on that form, he might, also, um, he might also have a medical degree. So just because it says on that previous form that, that graduates fall into category two, uh, he might be a graduate, but not a graduate of a, an appropriate um, a course that, that's related to this survey practice. So th this COE is, is more about the role you're doing within the firm than the qualification that you possess. So if you look down the bottom at, at Fred, who's an administration and, and office manager, um, as office manager, Fred's probably involved in, in quite a few high-end um, dealings and discussions. So he would need some, some of that extra training that someone 
who, who might just be doing some field work um, and a field assistant work or someone who might be just answering the phone. So it's very much role based, uh, the um, risk management training and COE, um, but, but it is important. Now, uh, a few people have mentioned to me um, that, that the costs might be a little bit prohibitive. So if we go back a few slides to the administration fee for this, bear in mind it's a small firm of seven people. There's an $850 administration fee and I mentioned where those fees go previously. Um, but scrolling forward to the training costs um, at nearly $1,800, that, that represents about a $2,500 investment uh, to participate in the scheme, which might seem a little steep uh, for a small firm. Um, but I suppose you've got to ask yourself the question is whether you value that training that, that you're getting, um, whether you place any value on the, um, uh, the, the cap of the liability. Um, now, also added to that, anyone who is an, an AXIS member, bearing in mind that, that AXIS um, partly underpin uh, the, the running of this scheme, uh, we've been able to negotiate a 10% premium reduction for those AXIS members who participate in the scheme, um, which we hope would sort of go um, a, a long way into helping pay for some of those associated costs. Now, um, you, know, you might ask why we've been able to do that. Um, in the eyes of, of an insurer, that anyone participating in the scheme and participating in active risk management, uh, effectively they're, they're lowering their risk profile by um, you know, participating in those activities and that training for their staff. Uh, and that's why they've been able to, to offer that, that discount. Um, you know, the other thing is those who aren't uh, access members, um, do you know what your PI access is? Um, if, if, if the risk management training and, and being a participant in the scheme saves you one claim, uh, that may represent, um, you know, the, the costs for, you know, the scheme costs for the next three years. So um, I, I tend to feel that the, the costs associated with the administration and the training are, are, are quite a small cost in, in the grand scheme of things. Obviously for larger firms, um, who have more staff, the costs are a lot more significant, but then obviously their PI costs are going to be a, a lot higher and that 10% discount um, becomes a lot more significant um, in, in that scenario. Uh, as I mentioned, they're, they're the topics that will be covered under the uh, risk management training. Um, Anyone sort of doing five hours will participate in 10 half hour modules. Anyone participating in two hours will, will do four half hour modules. Those topics um, will be touched on throughout uh, the, the different modules. And each module will sort of be tailored to a specific, um, uh, so, some of them will be generic modules that everyone needs to participate in but some will be targeted at specific roles within a firm. So someone who's doing uh, field work as opposed to someone who's doing um, you know, office administration or, or drafting or, um, or higher end um, activities. Um, now just a couple of uh, quotes here. If you believe that the training is expensive is because you don't know what ignorance costs. Companies that have the loyalty of their employees invest heavily in permanent training programs and promotional systems. Um, perhaps don't ask yourself if you can afford to be involved, but rather, can I afford not to be involved? So at, at the end of the day, the, 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 there's a number of different things that, a uh, number of different benefits from, from the scheme. Um, you know, the, the first thing which is the very trigger for the scheme is the liability cap. So some people might be attracted to that because, you know, if, if they get 
um, sued for more than what their PI insurance cover is, they've got that extra cushion um, of, of the liability cap. So look, it may at the, at the end of the day, it may just save someone's house. Um, now, the next thing I want to talk about is this logo has been in the news just recently. They were looking at making some changes to it. Um, now, that's a pretty sought after logo in, in terms of you know, products in Australia. Um, now, I was hoping Michelle might be able to just sort of look at the chat box here and, and relay some information to me. Um, but if, if some people can just type in that chat box what, they, what that logo means to them, just some one word answers on, on what, um, what they associate with that logo. Michelle, are you able to perhaps uh, relay some information from that chat box to me? Yep. Local. Local support, trust, homegrown, quality, loyalty, money back to Australian business, quality. Yep. So there's they're some of the words that I was actually looking for. Um, quality is number one. Um, so you, you see a product with that logo, um, you, you immediately associate it with quality. Um, high standards, uh, trust was another one that someone put in there. Uh, reliability, uh, performance, integrity. And the last one, they also relate that logo to a product being more expensive. Or is that product expensive or is it just good value? Um, so that's what the scheme will ultimately try and promote as, as well. There's all those, those qualities that promote high standards. But when you see this logo or when your customer sees this logo, what will they associate that logo with? Uh, hopefully all those things that we just talked about. Um, and they might also associate it with you being more expensive than, than someone else. Um, but you know, with that expense, that might also translate into something being you know, better value. Um, so generally someone with higher standards, um, people might be willing to pay a little more for. So this scheme not only promotes higher standards, but you might also be able to, you know, put a higher value on your service if you're you know, participating in this scheme. And that should be attractive to um, everyone. Um, now, I failed to mention earlier, or, or maybe I did, uh, there's a critical deadline coming up of September 30. Now, what that represents is it represents the end of the quarter since the scheme started. Um, now, there's a reporting period for the Professional Standards Council, which runs um, quarterly. So at the end of September, what I've got to do is I've got to tell the Professional Standards Council how many people are in the scheme, both corporate members and individual members, and, and they're going to want a fee from us for, 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 those, um, for those members. Now, the default position for the scheme is that everyone who's a CSN member is an automatic participant unless they opt out. Um, so if, if what I'm, the message I'm trying to get across to you is if that you have intentions of wanting to participate in the scheme, then please make contact with me before the end of September um, so that we can sort, sort that out. Because um, effectively anyone who's um, registered for the scheme already um, is considered a participant from July 1, regardless of when they, you know, if they signed up yesterday, um, by virtue of the opt-out system, they were already a member on July 1 and they continued to be unless they opt out. Um, now what I need everyone to do is to either opt out um, by September 30 and, and what Michelle will probably do is send an email around um, 
and it may or may not be with a form, but we need everyone to, if they don't have any intentions of, of participating, they need to opt out. Um, or if they do want to participate, then um, we need to talk and get you signed up and registered so that you um, you are a legitimate participant. Um, because while, while you're a, um, a CSN member and an automatic participant, uh, you won't be able to rely on the scheme um, until you uh, fulfilled some of those duties, which includes paying the administration fee, um, you know, including those disclosure statements on, on your um, uh, documentation, et cetera, et cetera. So that's September 30, which is coming up in a couple of weeks. Um, so hopefully that the key outcomes from this um, presentation have been that people have got a better understanding of what the key partnerships are surrounding the scheme, um, how the scheme works, uh, how the legislation has been implemented and, and the responsibilities of individuals and, and professionalism in, in general. All right, I've just got another little questionnaire to fill in. So while everyone jumps onto that questionnaire, I'll try and bring up the results of that questionnaire. Hopefully better success than what I had at the beginning. Um, while that's happening, uh, we do have some questions. So Steve, you might just go over just again to clarify. Um, so, uh, sorry, individuals. So um, the question was, are individuals liable for claims over their PI if they don't have this protection? Um, can you still hear me, Michelle? Yeah, okay, so sorry, can you just repeat that question? Are individuals liable for claims over their PI if they don't have this protection? Yeah, so, so essentially if, if a firm um, makes a mistake on a, on a project that, that's a, um, a quite expensive one, say it's a, it's a $3 million claim and they've only got PI cover for $2 million, uh, then your insurer is sure they'll, they'll fork out the, the two million dollars, but somewhere you've got to come up with an extra one million dollars to, to, to pay that um, that judgment that's been awarded by the courts. So, but under the scheme, if you've got a two million dollar cap, then that 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 judgment is sort of cut off at the pass, I suppose you could say, at the at the court level, um, and, and the judge will only award damages of two million dollars. So essentially, you know, if, if your uh, PI, you have, you have to carry the, um, the PI cover to match the scheme cap. Um, so you'll, you'll never, if you're a part of the scheme, you'll never be in a situation where you're underinsured, essentially. Well, hopefully that covers the, the question. The other, the other question is around um, the staff in the office. So you mentioned town planning, engineering and surveying yep. specifically. Yep. What about if they've got like environmental scientists, landscape architects, water boards, supervision to do with Sydney water? Uh, what about those kinds of stuff? Yeah, look, also essentially, like, I know with Sydney water, I, I believe that they might have an uncapped amount of liability. So that might not that the scheme might not suit that requirement just because of their requirement, their specific requirements of an uncapped liability. But you really need to go back, and this is where that disclaimer right at, back at the beginning of, of the presentation comes in that um, you, you probably need to seek your own legal advice as to who the scheme covers. Uh, and I mentioned, you know, obviously surveyors um, town planners and engineers, because it was specifically designed for those people. Some of those other uh, professionals on, on what I might call the fringe, you would really need to go and seek some legal advice and, and put the, the definition contained within the legislation in front of your legal practitioner and, and seek an opinion from them. Um, at, at the end of the day, um, the, the outcome of won't be 
known until it's gone before the court and and the the judge decides whether the the cap applies to those people or, or not um the, the ones that are on the fringe so it's a little bit of a gray area i know but that is the case with a with you know 99 percent of legislation it's, it's often open to interpretation um certainly those people as i said surveyors um engineers uh participating in subdivision work um town planners the typical survey practice um practitioners um they would certainly be covered but those ones on the fringe I, i'd really be seeking some uh, external ad advice as to whether they're um, covered or not. So is this limiting the dollars of the claim? Does it act to limit the liability to some statute of limitation time frame? Uh, no, not at all. So the statute of limitations time frame uh, varies in, in each jurisdiction as in each state. You know, on average, I think it's about six years but it doesn't vary the time frame. So the statute of limitations applies from when the problem was discovered. So you might have done a project 30 years ago and the problem was only discovered with that project a week ago. Um, it's still a problem um, and it will be a problem for another six, six or so years um, unless some sort of action um, becomes of it. So you would need to wait a further six years from when that problem was discovered until that problem goes away. And so if we have current PI of 10 million and then it's capped at 2 million under the scheme, does that mean they can reduce their PI cover and thus reduce their premium? So if they've got $10 million PI cover, they've probably got it for a reason. They're, they're probably doing work for a government or statutory department that requires them to have $10 million cover. Um, so they would probably need to look at that higher discretionary cap. So ordinarily, you know, if they're turning over less than $2 million a year, they would qualify for the $2 million cap. But if they've got $10 million cover for those other specific reasons, then they probably need to look at why they've got that cover and, and adopt that uh, discretionary higher cap so that 90% of their work would fall under the $2 million cap. So if you know the average sort of developer um, wants to sue you for $3 million and you've got a $2 million cap, then the cap would apply. But if you do something wrong and the government department wants to sue you for um, $10 million, then they can, uh, it, 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 as long as you've put it in that discretionary higher cap. Now, if you don't adopt that discretionary higher cap, then your cap across the board is $2 million. And if, if um, that government department that you're working for uh, specifically requires you to have a $10 million cover, then you may be in breach of contract. Um, have with them so for that we, project. Yeah, that's right. We've given some firms that are members in the scheme a letter to say that they are a part of this scheme and yep. therefore they are allowed to have a capped liability at $2 yep. million. Yep. Uh, And so some government agencies will accept that uh, and some major developers will also accept that. Yep. So you, you need to negotiate with the person that you're submitting that through. Yeah, and understand and procurement areas in government are difficult to deal with. We understand that and we will help you where we can in relation to that by providing you that information. That's why we've got all the information on our website for you to be able to guide people um, towards that, that end. And, and, uh, and so do you have to uh, like specify the clients when you ask for the cap? Do you say, yes, because I'm doing this work with Sydney Water or yes, I'm doing this word with roads? Yeah, yeah. so there's essentially three different types of discretionary hire caps. Uh, one is client-based, so you can nominate certain clients. Uh, another one is you can nominate uh, certain periods of the year. So you might say, well, look, I'm only going to be working on this project between September and December. So that's the period that I want the higher cap for. Um, and there's another one which I think is right across the board. But 
Uh, just, just touching on what Michelle said, um, is that if you've got some of these government departments um, and, and statutory authorities demanding these higher values of, of PI cover, um, there's, there's nothing stopping you negotiating with them um, to, to, to reduce that and, and perhaps selling them on the fact that you're part of this professional standard scheme. Um, something that I noticed someone had done recently is they'd actually split their firm into two entities, one that um, does all their normal work and, and the other entity uh, work, works in that environment where they uh, work for those the departments that essentially have an unlimited or, or higher cap. And, and that's just, that's really good risk management. It's, it's protecting um, you know, the vast percentage of your business and, and only exposing that at 10% on the other side. So how do you invoke, sorry, I'm conscious we've gone over time. So I want to try and get as many questions as we can and, you know, know that um, people need to get back to work. How do you invoke the cap if you get a claim for more? Does there have to be a court ruling? Uh, essentially, there has to be a court ruling. Um, so what will happen is, is that if something goes to court, and generally, yeah, if we're talking those amounts of, of dollars, it, it does go to court. Um, so what will happen is it will go to court, the judge will award, da award damages of a certain amount, that, that, that may well be over the cap. And so the, the award of damages will, will remain, but then when it comes to paying out those damages, that's when the cap applies. Um, so the judge will have, a, I guess, almost a secondary um, judgment saying, well, look, uh, I've, I've awarded $3 million worth of damages, but the cap applies to this firm. So therefore, uh, only $2 million applies. Okay, so jumping into just a couple of last questions about training. So there was a question about, do I have to do the COE plus my bossy CPD? The no. answer is likely no. Uh, mm. You've seen the, the sorts of topics that are gonna be covered by the CPD and uh, we feel confident. We haven't assessed them yet as the ratified organisation, but once we do assess them, or we expect that we will be able to assess them for bossy. So you should be able to count those hours towards your bossy requirements. So don't panic about that. Um, Steve, the question is, when is that training going to start to be available? Uh, so we're hoping to roll it out in uh, late October. Oh, sorry, early, early October. Um, I've mentioned to a few people, so I've, I've got to have, as I said, got to have that um, ratified by the um, COE committee of CSN, which will happen in the next week or so. Um, and then from then we should be right to, um, to roll out the training from early October. Bear in mind that um, for compliance um, as part of the scheme, you only have to complete that training um, within the 12 months of that scheme period. So, um, you know, it's obviously the sooner the better so that you don't run into problems, um, you know, next year when you run out of time. Um, but as long as you, you complete that uh, training within that 12 month scheme period, you, you're deemed to have complied with the requirements. And we, we've already talked about the fact that the training will be varied each year. So yeah, as much yep. as we can. So it's yep. not like you're going to do the same course over and over, okay? Well, essentially, uh, the, the training will ultimately be uh, targeted uh, around trends uh, and, and what's happening with claims, um, PI claims. And, and we'll be... You know, so currently at the moment, uh, thing, errors and claims that are trending um, happen to be problems with... Um, benchmarks and problems with um, you know, people doing uh, being accused of, of doing work that is sort of not part of their brief. Um, so they're being asked to do things that are outside their brief um, or, or being accused of not doing things that are actually outside of their brief. So those sorts of things will be, will be the ones that will be the target of the... And the Professional Standards Council are interested in service to the community. So there'll be a lot in the service area as well and complaints and how you manage that. So if you get a complaint in your office, 
you know, how do you deal with that? And so we'll want to cover some things like that. And that's quite varied as we get feedback from PSC around what they're hearing as well. Um, so uh, some firms, Steve, have a board of directors, yep. but not all of their board are active in the firm. Some of them are non-exec people that come in. Do they also need to undertake the training? Uh, look, I've said to people that the people who have to do the training should be active participants in the in the firm. Um, look, it's it's one of those grey areas. Um, essentially, their 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 assets are exposed if they're board members. Um, if something goes wrong in terms of a professional indemnity or professional um, competence. But um, at the end of the day, if they're directors of the board, well, the, the firm carries the professional indemnity anyway, and the, and the firm is going to be the one targeted in, in the first instance. So there's, there's not a great amount of risk to, their, um, yeah, to them personally. Um, but look, I'd encourage everyone to do it, whether, whether they're um, active or not, but I, I wouldn't. I'd suggest that the Professional Standards Council wouldn't be looking for those non-active people to be to be participating. Uh, and just in relation to the charge for training, so just going back to one of the slides that um, Steve shared earlier, there there is the the charge to be a participant in the scheme due to the quite a lot of administration that has to be undertaking. And then, yes, there is a charge for the training that you have to do. But again, that training is $65 plus GST, I think, Steve, yeah. per hour. Uh, and those five hours training that you do as a business owner counts towards your bossy CPD. So it's not like we're adding, you know, all of a sudden now you've got to do 20 hours because you've got to do your bossy and then you've got to do this. So it is included. So um, I think that, uh, yes, there is a cost. We've tried to keep it as low as possible. Um, and uh, just incidentally, somebody told me yesterday that Pia charged $230 for their hour long webinars. So, you know, I think our prices are still pretty reasonable, but yes, there is a charge and it's uh, usually charged to you at the onset. Uh, and then just another question about the training. Um, uh, if the firm fails to meet their annual training requirement, is their PI cover, probably not their PI cover voided, but their they'd be non-compliant with the scheme if they don't do their training. Is that right, Steve? Yeah, essentially. We'll do everything in our power to make sure that they do comply. Um, so I, I can't imagine why um, someone wouldn't comply. It's not hard to do the training, everybody. We promise. How does the scheme fit in with runoff insurance? Um, good question. Um, it's a question I haven't been answer, asked before. Um, look, because you're in, in when you're in runoff, you're not actually practicing. You're not actually allowed to practice, so you're not um, yeah, you're not ge generating potentially more more problems. And in, in fact, the scheme is it, a little bit different uh, between the scheme and PI. So PI um, insurance covers you for work you might have done 30 years ago. The scheme will only cover you for the work that you've done within that scheme period, that 12 month period that you're a participant in the scheme. So if you've, um, if you've done something back in May of this year, um, then, then that's, that won't be covered by the, the scheme. Uh, okay, only, last, only work moving forward. Last question. Um, so if IS or ACS or somebody else runs some sort of training uh, yep. on risk management or something else, that kind of customer service, you know, those sorts of things that fit in with the scheme, can yep. that count towards their COE training? Uh, not at the moment, it can't. Um, the, the, I'm the key... sure we can make a way to make that work, Steve. The, the sure key, the, we know some people. The key thing is people. that... that the, the entities that have been set up to report to um, the Professional Standards Council uh, need to be able to guarantee that that training has been uh, targeted in those specific areas that they need. And the only way that we can um, guarantee that is if we do the training ourselves. Um, so 
notwithstanding that, there are some service agreements that sit in the background uh, that give some exclusive rights to the, the training uh, that's required. Um, but why would you want to do it with anyone else? Well, you'd want to do it with ACS. I've got no problem. ACS runs some fabulous risk management training at various okay. times. Yes, it's part of our Business Academy. Okay. We're about to do it. Ed Garvin and I have got some great teaching coming up in the Business Academy. So you'd want to do it under there for sure. Right. Um, look, thank you very much, everybody. We have gone over time, but we know that there were some really important questions. I've just posted in the chat the website. Of course, it is on the Consulting Surveyors .com.au website. There's a whole um, a number of pages there dedicated to the scheme, all of the forms, everything that you need to fill in is there on the scheme. So can I encourage you to take another look at that? Uh, Steve's mobile number is also on that page. So you can call him directly any time of the day yep, or night, anytime. right? 24-7, yep. give Weekends. him a call, drop him an email. Uh, he'd be very, very happy to answer your questions. Can I encourage you that this is one of the ways, so as I go around and I chat to all of you, you talk to me about the professionalism within the industry. This is one of the things that we can try to do to lift the standard of across the whole industry. And so imagine if all of our members um, across the national, across Australia, were members of the scheme, using the logo, displaying the blurb that says that you're a member of the professional standard scheme, wouldn't the major developers and the government people, uh, local, local councils, state government agencies, wouldn't they want to only use providers that are part of this scheme? That is the purpose of the scheme. That is one of the main reasons. There are some monetary benefits to you in saving in your insurance. Uh, we understand there's a cost to it, but if you think about overall, this could be one of the ways we can lift the standard of the industry across the board. So I do hope that you'll get involved. Feel free to talk to Steve, feel free to talk to me. All the information is there and we'll have more information coming out to you in the next week. So thank you all very much for joining us. Really appreciate your time today. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you all again on the 22nd of September, I think, where we're gonna talk about True North. I thought there was only one North, but apparently there's not. Apparently there can be more than one. Uh, so I don't know. I'm quite looking forward to hearing from Craig Roberts. We'll also have Mark Grohl giving us a few updates on some things that are happening in the plan search area. So be sure to join that one. If you haven't already used your ACS freebie, you can use it for that one. I've let Abigail know. So we'll see you next month. Uh, no, later this month, 22nd of September. We will see you for that one. Uh, and I look forward to seeing the rest of you at the October conference in Tweed Heads, face to face real interaction. It's going to be awesome. Uh, we've opened a second room. So if you want to book and join us at Kingscliff, register now. You can also stream it. It will be run virtually online. So look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will catch you later. I feel like I need some outro music. Doo -doo 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 -doo.